Welcome back to the Byron Lazine podcast where I have my best friend in real estate, Lisa Chinati. Tom Tool will get upset about that, but that is just the truth. She's one of the most accountable friends, a good friend to somebody who's accountable. Yes, we talk about the $5,000 in Louis Vuitton I had to buy her this year. Lisa is the team leader of the number one team in the entire state of Massachusetts. She's going to share with you exactly how she has built that monster, what they're thinking about over the next 12 to 18 months, and some of the charitable donations that she makes that nobody knows about. Stick around, share this pod with somebody. This is my favorite pod ever. A little bit closer, you have a softer voice. Oh, I like that. I like that Bobby said that about you. You have a softer voice. Okay. Most people wouldn't say that. Because Lisa has such a hard exterior, <laughs> right? Lisa, I mean, do a lot of people say that about you? <laughs> they might. They might. Well, I know personally, and thanks for the kind words on the 5 a.m. call the other day. It meant a was, lot to me. That was very nice of you. Um, I know that you have a very soft person, not personality, but interior you're very you care a lot about people and people see lisa chinati all the success everything you've built and they're like wow i I mean i can't break through that hard shell without maybe getting to know you right that's a fair statement yeah 100 percent. but how does that we're first of all we're sitting in lisa's seventeen thousand. i made a little joke 1700 seventeen thousand square feet new hq number one team obviously Massachusetts, if you know who Lisa Johnny is already, you know all the success she's had building such a dynamic team, great operator systems. Um, how has it been like with all your, you've got what, 65 agents? 65 in active production, and then yeah. maybe 20 more that we're working on building up into active production. How's it been with your massive growth of getting like that? amount of people, that many people to like really understand maybe the Lisa that I know that, you know, that really caring, loving Lisa. It takes time. I, I think anybody here would tell you that I think that there's times when it comes out, but the business side always kind of trumps when I'm in the building. So it, I am super intentional about spending time with people outside of the building when the, the softer side tends to come out. Yeah. What's that look like? Ah, so, you know, the home side is very different. Um, it, I'm a mom, so there's a super nurturing side, right? My two girls are my world. And I think people who can get outside of the office and see the, I did foster care for years, right? We had over 50 kids come in and out of our house over the span of the time that we were an open foster home. Wow. Um, Before real estate? Uh, yep. And into the, in the beginning? early years. And wow. then it just got, the real estate got too busy and it wasn't fair to the kids. Um, but there's a side, like I work to be able to support my charitable work, right? Mm-hmm. I work to be able to give back to DCF is one of the biggest causes that I support still to this day. I can't donate time, but I donate a fair amount of money. Um, and our headquarters here, as you saw when you drove up, is actually yeah. right below the head of the DCF for the state of Massachusetts. Yes, it is. Yeah, so same building. One of the biggest branches sits right above us. And we do a lot to support not just the social workers there by donating supplies as they need them because state budgets get slashed like everything else. But we do a lot to support the families that open their homes to foster kids. And then we do a lot to support those children that are in state care. Um, so that's one, one big aspect of it, right? All and I don't, I don't see you talking about it a lot on social or showing that side. What's your take on like agents or teams really being out in front and center on showing their charitable work and sh- uh, charitable donation? Cause I don't see you doing a lot of it. Maybe once in a while you might share something, but. Yeah. So I don't, because I, I almost, and so we kind of talked earlier about that 5 a.m. call, right? Yeah. And when we talk about what the drunk monkey is about why I haven't been so great about doing a ton of content and doing those kind of things, it I always feel like there's like these different layers to it, right? And one of the things with the charitable work is I feel like you do charitable work to make yourself feel good or to know that you're doing good. But I almost feel like it diminishes it if somebody's doing charitable work to 
build their brand. That to me defeats the purpose of doing charitable work. I'm I'm the same way. Um, I'm I'm in total agreement with you. Not to say that like there are some people that have built a business and it's like 10% of the shoe goes to this and, and it's just like interwoven and it's why they started the business to begin with. And if that's your truth, fine. Yep. But just like I do feel like it's almost trickery to some sense of like I'm if I'm going to just make it all about this, why don't I just go just like do the charity? <laughs> right. <laughs> why even be in the business, right? A hundred percent. And I I think when when you look at it, right, there's some things that we do that we put out, like we'll do a scholarship. Um, we didn't do it this year, but we've done it almost every other year where we'll sponsor a scholarship for – um, kids graduating high school in mm. underserved communities. Um, at the beginning of the year, we did um, scholarships for school teachers in schools where they could, we would sponsor a couple thousand dollars worth of supplies for their classrooms kind of stuff, right? And those things, I feel like, I guess, kind of go hand in hand with the marketing because it's getting out there that we're, that we're doing something and reaching out to people to that need assistance, right? But the stuff where we're sending out assistance unsolicited, right, or whatever, I also kind of feel like it's a privacy thing mm-hmm. at a certain level. I feel like it would be taking advantage of people in lesser situations to be able to put out as content, hey, we're providing for Christmas, right, like presents and food and groceries and money to cover their heating bills for a winter. Like that just doesn't feel right to me. Uh, I'm in agreement. Doesn't mean, Lisa, and the reason we're here today, besides recording this pod, is to get you to do more content. As the incredible businesswoman that you are, as a thought leader in our space, you're not, you're sharing so much behind the scenes. People that are in the Tom Ferry ecosystem, in our mastermind, people that know you just from the business that have reached out and connect, you've given everything away over and over and over again. And you haven't gotten enough of the eyeballs on Instagram, which matter, or the eyeballs on YouTube, which matter, to know about it. Because you just haven't decided to say, I'm going to go out there and put this content, which is great, which a lot of people can learn from. You've had so many people in the old office that I've been to up here, the old HQ, in the office and had like mega days where you're just giving systems out, you start putting that content out, which is what we're gonna really like dig into a little bit today, out there for people to see, your brand is gonna be on the the plateau, on the Mount Rushmore that it deserves because you are such an incredible business woman in this space. So maybe for people that are, in the same, they're like, they're operating a business. They love that because you love it. You love tinkering and making things better and kind of just checking in on the business and improving it. For somebody who's just like that, who's in their business, why, what's holding you back? And like, where can we get the breakthrough that might help somebody else kind of break through? Fair enough. All right. So back to the that whole drunk monkey thing, right? So it, it's twofold. So the first part of it is, and it, I don't feel that the company is about me, right? And so when I really stop to kind of think about why don't I do it, it's because even though my name is on the door, right? And I, I know gonna, you, your name's on the door, so it you, is. <laughs> but my name's not on my door. I know. And if you were in my company, right, you would actually know that one of the things that I regret is putting my name on the door. If I had ever known in 2017 when I made that decision stupidly that it would become what it is now, I would have gone the direction that you had gone with something not about me. Because it, I think it only is what it is because of every single person that's here within the company now, right? And by having my name on there, I think it makes it feel like it's too much about one person as opposed to being about the whole, right? So I often look at it when it comes to putting out content in that it shouldn't necessarily be me. And that's maybe a drunk monkey on one end, right? Because yep. I think that there, to your point, I get that there's some value that I bring, right? And I own that at a certain level, people are here partly because of me. Not necessarily 100% because of me, but maybe partly. 
And then the second end of it becomes drunk monkey side that I always question whether there are people smarter than me who are doing things better than me. And what does my voice matter, well, right? There's absolutely people that are always going to be smarter. I mean, we get to sit down and hang out with people like Gino. And I talk about Gino, absolutely. If you, especially the last since he was in, I think we were all in Napa together. Yes. That's where he showed up last. I really, because I got to sit at the table with Gino Blafari, CEO of BHHS. And I'm like, man, this guy's got to be, I don't know, 70s. I think so, yeah. Right? And he's like taking detailed notes from things that I'm saying or DJ and Lindsay at the table, just the discussion at the table, detailed notes. Is the dude smarter, more experienced, way further along on the journey than us? Absolutely. But yet learning in reverse from some of the emerging players in the industry and same thing, is there going to be somebody who's more experienced? Always, always, right? That's just always going to be the way it is. But it doesn't discount everything that you've built and that you know. And the fact that somebody that maybe has 20 more years of experience and maybe is even smarter, right? And however you're going to categorize that can still learn from you. And then there's obviously 99% of the industry that hasn't accomplished you know, a tenth of what you have that can definitely learn from you too. That's it. Fair. Fair statements all around. Lisa, Lisa, she won't budge. Look at her. She doesn't even want to budge right now. She's, well, it, I mean, it's a fair If you're statement. watching on YouTube, you can see the body language there. She's like, doesn't mean I want to do content. <laughs> well, but so here's the thing, right? I, I've been thinking about this since that phone call last week, right? Yeah. And... In my 5 a.m. call the other let's day. Let's talk about the phone call. I called. We're, we're on a call. We're on our check-in in the morning because we have, we have a little accountability check-in a couple times a week. And after I call you and I say, I'm coming to your office. We're going to do a podcast, right? And after the podcast, we're going to do some clips just like I do them, thought leader clips, speaking to the industry type of content for, for your social we're going, to do, we're going to do the walkthrough podcast for BAM, and we're just going to like connect with your producer, your marketing peeps, and we're going to t take a deep dive on this stuff because you have to go there with how important brand is right now, with how like online leads are dropping. We just had this conversation before the pod. Yep. Brand is real important. Hundred, a thousand percent. So that was the phone call we had, and go ahead. And so, right, tough love. And I got what it was, right? By virtue of you doing that, it was the exact same moment that you and I had in Dallas yes, in April the tough of love you gave me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A hundred, a hundred thousand percent. And I knew it when you were saying it because it was, it was the reverse of everything that happened through 2020 it, and up into April of 2021. It was you at that moment in Dallas telling me, I know how to recruit 10 times better than you do, meaning me, and I know how to scale and you haven't done it with your business. You've done it with your maybe your content or we weren't even having a content conversation. Now we're having the reverse where I'm like, right. I know content, you need to be doing it. And you were absolutely right. And that's where the $5,000 bet, which we got to put that clip out there. Is that clip done? It's, it's being worked All right. I actually had it <laughs> sitting in my phone because Posnick took the video of me. So I lost this bet. If you don't know the story yet, I lost this bet to Lisa in, we set it in 2020? No, it was- It was 2021? We actually it was set 2021. it- 2021, yeah, it was yeah, a year it ago. It was March of, or April 1. It, the, it started April 1, but we were sitting in Tom's uh, building in yeah. March of 2021, the first trip that we all took together after right. COVID restrictions kind of lifted. And this is when the, the real kick came like, you got to build a call center, whatever you call it, ISA, SDR. You've got to get your recruiting like to a level where you're treating it like inbound lead activity, right? right. Where, where it's that important. You got to scale this thing. You got to build a moat around your business, which is what Tom tells us all the time. And so you set the bet for myself, Tom Tool, Joe Biggs, $5,000 bet. It was, a, it was a- It was genius. It was genius. And listen, when Jill and Tom- they just accept or whatever Lisa says. All right, I, I accept the bet. Here's a five thousand dollar bet. If we lose, which was a thousand transactions from April, mid-April to mid-April of this year, 
closing a thousand deals in that time frame, which at the point we were at, it's like, okay, we're going to close over 500. We're kind of on that trajectory, but a thousand isn't really, you said it on the 5M call. It wasn't going to happen. It wasn't going to happen because there was no ramp up time. It was 30 day ramp up time. Right. What are you going to do in 30 days? You know, <laughs> you know, you can, what are you going to do? Like start interviewing people in 30 days? So yeah, you just, you weren't ever going to get there. And that practicality, I said to Jill and Tom, like, we're not going to have any chance of winning this bet. Oh, don't, don't be such a, you know what, you know, you just got to do it. And, and then when you guys were all kind of giving it to me, I'm like, you know what? You're right. It, this is called an investment into <laughs> the future, right? This is, I spent $5,000 on some crappy lead sources throughout my career that have just gone to nothing. And this is actually going to bring me value because it's going to light a fire and that accountability ringing in my head every single day that uh, I'm going to have to face Chinati and give her this Louis bag, which I did have to do anyways <laughs> back in Dallas. And we're going to show that clip on Instagram if it's, if it's, it's already done or coming to be done. It'll be... Uh, out there pretty soon. I just had it in my phone forever. And I forgot about it that Posnick took it, but yeah. So the bet was five thousand dollars for a thousand units from April fifteenth of last year to April fifteenth of this year. Now I knew Tom and Joe were like just do it, just do it. I'm like, uh, there's no chance I'm going to get there. There's absolutely no chance I'm going to be able to get to a thousand units over this next. 12 months. I knew I had to invest in, in different things if I had any chance of getting there, but just the the ramp of the next 12 months of the investments I had to make, I wasn't going to come close, but I did it anyway, only because I knew it would motivate me to make some... I ponied up the bags. How are the bags, by the way? They're fantastic. Yeah. All four of them. <laughs> All four of them. Yeah. So you got bags from Tom Tool, Joe Biggs, and myself, but, but it was... It's more about the you know, the reason behind why we made the bet that I was like, okay, this makes sense. Right. And you're not going to leave me hanging. And it was kind of like, here's, you know, more information here. Here's things that have worked for me. Here's some things to avoid, you know, even when we built our call center, right. We started off boom, hot, like four people. And you're like, here are things to avoid. We still made mistakes. We didn't make as many as we would have if I didn't know what the heck I was doing going into it. But you're going to make mistakes anytime you're trying to scale. There's going to be growth pains, right? Yep. What are some of the big mistakes that you're planning on making over the next 12 to 18 months as the market shifts? Ooh, do we plan to make mistakes? But just knowing mm -hmm. that they're going to happen because yeah. you're going to go so hard in one direction or another that there's going to be inevitable growth pains. Where yep. are you Where are you pouring your assets into over the next 12 to 18 months? So one of the things will be really going even deeper on diversifying our lead sources. So historically, business for the company has been 80% comes from company-generated leads, yeah. right? And I think one of the- Z, RDC, those types of places. Google pay-per-click, yep. uh, you know, any kind of online lead source, the referral partners that stream in, the home lights, the up nests, yep. all of that kind of stuff. I might just announce layoffs, by the way. A, a bunch Yesterday. have. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and Upnest got acquired by Realtor.com, yep. right? Yep. A whole bunch of stuff shaking out in there. I think you'll see more of that acquisitions for the big ones, mm -hmm. whether it's Zillow or Realtor? It's unavoidable. Yeah. It's unavoidable. Um, but so I think one of the mistakes that we'll make is as those things shift, misjudging where lead volumes are going to fall, right? And so it could unintentionally lead to a decrease in production because we've undergenerated the number of leads that we need in order to, or undergenerated underrepresented budgets. I, I don't know exactly. There's so much variability, right? Like we're a flex team, a big flex team. And you and I were talking this morning about our flex volume is down 75% from where it was 12 months ago, yeah. right? And not due to performance at this point. We're, you know, looking at goals. Let, let's be clear. Due to the fact that all of these portals leads have taken a massive hit in 2022, whether it's Z, RDC, Redfin is the one that's out front saying it. Like yep. our lead traffic is down. 
something me and Lisa have not talked about a lot on this podcast, but we both use and have used for years is virtual assistants. Virtue Desk offers the absolute best virtual assistants. They have a variety of different skill sets, whether it's marketing, ISAs, executive assistants, customer service. These virtual assistants are the best in the industry. And Lisa and I have grown our business through the use of VAs year after year. Every year we say, hey, where should we hire another VA? Oftentimes, even before we consider a W-2. There's so many advantages to working with Virtue Desk to grow your business. Hit the link below, have a conversation with Virtue Desk. I'm telling you, VAs have blown up my business and they will for you as well. Hit the link below for Virtue Desk. Ball players. A hundred percent. And I think Zillow's actually even kind of saying it right now as well. Yeah. Right. And the tough part, and I think one of the things that folks like you and myself and a, a lot of the people that we know who lean into online leads is we can only make our estimates based upon the information that we're getting from our partners. Correct. You know, and so if the Zillows and the Realtor.coms aren't forecasting accurately on their end, it makes it even more difficult for us to forecast on our end. So we could end up with the mistake of undergenerating unintentionally by believing those partners a little bit too much about where their own forecasts are going to be. Or it could be that all of a sudden nobody anticipates that consumer demand shoots back up in terms of the number of leads that are being generated. We are overgenerating leads, take a decrease in conversion, and then potentially a decrease in profitability, mm -hmm. right? And that's sometimes just as big a risk as over-generating is sometimes the bigger problem than under-generating, but for the fact that when a business gets to a certain point, you count on a certain number of transactions just to cover the day-to-day -day expenses. So you're leaning more into like what we're talking about, brand. Yep. Going to go heavy there. Where else? Um, so brand is a big one. Our database, we've got over 100,000 folks already in our database, right? And we've got to figure out how yeah. to continue to nurture the folks that we've already come in contact with those that have raised their hands already over the past two to five years. One, one thing I think is really smart for everybody, no matter if you're the solo agent, the team, wherever you are right now in your career is what you showed me before the pod. And I can talk about that, right? The, the website that's under development, you're going to be doing the webinars uh, or um, yeah, in live seminars, not webinars, Correct. seminars, in-person seminars yep. for the public. And if you have a hundred thousand person database, which you probably don't like Lisa, but whatever your database is, it could be 200 people. You get 10 of those 200 people to show up in office to a seminar where you can educate them on what's going on over the next 12 months. That's going to be really powerful. I, I like this for a lot of different reasons. You can capture content for your brand while you're doing it. You have a reason to reach out to that database that doesn't look like, hey, are you still having thoughts about selling or buying? Right. You actually have value you're bringing them and you're educating them during uncertain times. In fact, like you're talking about you know, giving back and all the giving back that you do. I think one way every agent can give back if they don't have the money to like just give to a charity is by helping educate their community because- Home ownership is like again on a decline with all the institutional buyers and investors coming in and houses are unaffordable. But if you can figure out a way to buy a house, right, and, and stop being someone who is paying someone else's mortgage, who is, you know, essentially paying someone else's equity, become a homeowner, the faster you're going to start building your own wealth because that's where the majority of Americans' wealth is. The, it ties into the the famous saying, right? Your income is in direct correlation to the size of the problems that you solve, yeah. right? And it is. I was driving into work with my daughter this morning. She's 18, right? And one of the things that her and I were talking about is what it's going to look like for her generation to become homeowners. And she got her real estate license. She just graduated high school and she's she did, Started 18. Started first year of college. Yep. Yeah. And so we were talking about it, and I think she had this epiphany as it's her first kind of exposure into the real estate market and the prices of homes and understanding how much income she would need in order yeah. to be able to afford a home. Yeah. And she looked at me this morning and she was like, I think my generation's in trouble. I don't know how we afford half a million dollar homes 
that when are, most of them have two hundred thousand dollars in college debt. And that's exactly what we were talking about in like, you know, being able to be really smart about what that debt load is going to look like yeah. and um, and how do they save and make decisions differently from your generation and my generation where we graduated college and started renting apartments. And I think we're going to see like her generation coming back home and living with oh, parents. Oh, for sure. Yeah, um, you already see that for sure coming back home. And I don't... You know, I think when you're that young, I mean, I bought homes and made huge mistakes when I was that young. You don't need to necessarily be thinking about buying, but you should just, and unfortunately not teaching this in high school, you should start to get some interest and some education on the real estate industry, on what real estate can do for you personally and for your wealth. Because if you're not like, you know, some half percent entrepreneur who's going to like build this massive company who's going to give you cash flow and you're going to be you know 99.9 percent .9 of america you really do need to own where you live like this is just like dave ramsey basic stuff yep like own your home that's like the only debt he actually you know will recommend getting a mortgage paying it down and, and accumulating some wealth over time yeah it's what, huge what can it, you know Web uh, seminars and webinars are one way to do it. But what does it look like if we're really going to, in our communities, solve that problem, educating them, obviously, on what it means to own a house and like it's 75x greater wealth and all of that, like give them the stats and the data and show them the charts and what else can agents in their community, the real estate community do for their community to help people and s help solve the unaffordable home issue? I think it's going to vary from community to community, right? Mm -hmm. I think that that's, it. I think agents need to understand the demographics and the dynamics going on within their own marketplace. Being the local police officers better than coming in from some other, you know, area that doesn't know the area. Right. So that's going to be one part of it. I think the next is seeking out other professionals within the industry who have access to programs and different things that are going to be able to help help these young people set themselves up, right? Mm -hmm. Financial planners being a big one. Um, to your point, high schools don't do it anymore. They don't give any education. And I question whether their parents actually always have the knowledge and the skill to even be able to impart on the kids. Yeah, and most times no. Right. And I think that that is, I think it's one of the biggest systemic problems that we have in society, right? Is we are an instant gratification, credit card driven mm. um keep being better than the person next to you kind of society. And we, I think as an industry, have a responsibility to help people plan for what it's going to look like to be able to have those assets and protect their savings. As inflation keeps going up, you're actually seeing now, because during COVID, I was like, wow, people are saving more money than ever. And obviously, we had all the stimulus. But right now, as inflation is going up, what are you seeing? You said that credit cards are ticking up again. At the cost of everything. Yeah. Think about it, right? The cost of gas. People are trying to keep up with that lifestyle too. Yeah, yeah. they don't want to make the cuts, right. right? They don't want to have the hard decisions. And, you know, even I mean, we have them in the office, right? From the business perspective, right? The business is, our business is facing it, right? The cost of almost everything that we're doing, the cost of leads, the cost of copy paper, the, the cost of everything is going up. So are you making cuts? Are you taking some medicine right now? Right now you're having a year that is probably going to be a record year. Yeah. Um, so, we're ahead of where we've – it's our best year ever so far. Yeah. But I think it would be foolish to not be starting to plan, yeah. right? And so we're looking at things and saying, I think there's a little bit of uncertainty, yeah. right? Do we continue to have our best year ever or – do things slide back a little bit? And do we end up potentially being flat with where we were last year? Okay, because that could happen over the next six months. You just don't know for yeah. sure. What kind of cuts? Are you, we're not talking employee cuts or are we? Or are we talking freezing hiring? Like what kind of cuts? Yeah, it's, do you, a, do you it's think? a great question. So in terms of hiring, yeah, I think we are looking at saying, you know, we need to be really smart and can we make investments across every department of the company, assuming that we're still going to sell 1,200 or 1,400 houses this year? Mm -hmm. And that would be a really foolish decision, right? In terms of making employee cuts, we're not at the point where we're making employee cuts yet, but 
smart business decisions say we are staffed up assuming that we're going to do 1200 to 1400 transactions and we might do a thousand right and there's always this risk right of like we went through covid and we made we made a commitment to our staff through covid that if we sold no houses for 6 months we wouldn't have to lay anybody off yeah, same right same here and we're in that same point right now we never need to lay off anybody but it's also a super important thing to be able to continue to have a healthy business, yeah. right? And so if we look at where do we start to make investments to protect the business and to protect all the, you and I have had this discussion, right? Every decision that we make, like the weight yeah. of, it's the weight of 400 people Correct. that I feel every night when I go to bed, yeah. right? Every decision impacts not just the staff and not just the agents, but their spouses, their kids, and everybody whose paychecks they support, whether it's paying mortgages, yep. buying groceries, paying tuition bills, or whatever that is. And so some of the decisions that we face with this is, I think we all knew COVID was temporary, right? And we kind of knew that that, I think if we paid attention, you kind of knew it was going to be a very short dip, yep. but that we it was going to go up. talking about the V or the U or the, what, you know. And we all knew that that was probably, realistically, a max of six months. And it turned yeah. out to be six weeks, yeah. right? That was the reality. I think when we're looking at this, I think we're going to see the same thing. I think it's going to be a decrease and then it's going to start to go back up again. But I don't think it's going to be six weeks. And I no. can't look at you right now and say that it's just going to be six months. Right. Right. I agree with that. And so do we make the decision that we have to protect the company and protect those 400 people for 12 months or 18 months versus just riding out a six-month lull? Yeah. And I think that that's kind of what we're facing, right? There will be some companies during, if it's 18 months, let's just say that's what it is. It's the next year and a half. It's, it's going to be some hard times for everybody. There will be some real estate teams, companies that excel and keep growing, that yep. beat market. Yeah. There's going to be some that just say, I'm taking my medicine, I'm bunkering down completely and flat or 10% drop is good enough for me. I'm going to make it out on the other side. What's it going to take for the real estate team or company that decides I'm going to beat market through the down times? I'm going to excel. What does that look like? So, I mean, that's what we're planning on, right? That's that's what everybody, by the way, is planning or, yep. or crossing their fingers hoping on. Yeah, which, there's more than hopes here, yeah. right? And I think that that's the, that's the thing is it, there's solid plans in place. We are – we've quadrupled our marketing spend in certain lead sources over the past three months. Yep. And we've got the kind of plans in place to be able to quadruple it again. Right. As others pull back from marketing, we're going to continue to take the risk and put the money into marketing. We're going to go deeper on the training of the people that are here and understanding that there are some skills that have been lost over the past two to four years. I heard you talking about that this morning. Yeah. I So in my the 5 a.m. call this morning, I've sat with a group of 14 agents who've all been in the business for more than 12 months. This is an incredible story. And when I asked them how many had ever like written an offer without or had closed a deal and never done an inspection, there were more hands than I expected. Yeah. Right. And when I asked how many had had to negotiate a repair after inspection, because you know, in most of the markets across the U.S., we've waived inspections, we've yep. done them for health and safety purposes That's how you win only. The deal. Yep. And so when most of our deals are being done without inspections. There's an art and a science to negotiation. You and I built our businesses on that, yeah. right? You learn to sell by how well you could negotiate. Yep. I don't think maybe half the agents in the industry right now have never actually had to negotiate. Right. And you, Well, you said something interesting today. So first of all, finish, finish one out of 14 had done a negotiation after inspection, yep. which is crazy mm -hmm. because- even if you do an inspection during the last two years, it's like, well, we're not negotiating after. Just the report is- You're in or you're out. The report's for your you know, top drawer in your kitchen and sit there for the next 10 years. But you said something interesting about the art of negotiation. Like Some people don't realize that in a tactic that I used to do all the time would be when I was you know, listing homes, would be to not be responsive. 
It's and, crazy. And people get so wildly upset about that. Like, how do you not respond to the buyer agent? Well, I've had this conversation with my seller. They know what I'm doing. Yep. I'm in clear communication on my responsibility to my client, but I'm not responding in a negotiation to the buyer agent because I want them to outthink themselves for 24 to 48 hours. Yep. That, that's and just one part of it, right? Because their guessing is Byron just busy? Is he not paying attention? Is he not looking at his email? Or do they not care about this offer enough because it's not attractive enough? And that's ultimately the one thought I want them to start having so that when we do talk in maybe 48 hours, it's, you know, my seller's just really not that motivated by the number. And so I'm sure you guys have talked about, because it's been 48 hours, I'm sure you guys have discussed another number at this point. What does that look like? Yep. Tell me what that, let's just start talking, getting information so then I have the information to know, hey, I think we can get them here. Do you, do you want me to lock that in or not? Right. And then there's also the part, there's that part of it, which is huge. And then the other part of it, I don't think people understand that we're going to enter a, a phase where we're going to negotiate each contract multiple times. Right. Right. We're going to negotiate it just to get the offer accepted. We're going to negotiate it after inspection. Yep. And I'm going to guess we're going to start negotiating stuff hardcore after appraisals. Correct. Right. And I, I think one of the things that a lot of agents don't understand is that how they negotiate that offer price is going to directly impact how all negotiations go yep. from that point on. And how you negotiate, there's other negotiations in there because you're negotiating with the buyer agent or the listing agent, whatever side you're on, but you're negotiating, conversating, consulting, educating your client. And so, hey, we're negotiating to this price right now before the inspection because I know we're factoring in five to eight thousand dollars of negotiation down the road that we're gonna give up. I'm I'm gonna hopefully only give up four. We're gonna hopefully get it down to three, like right. But like we're setting this up to know that there's five or eight thousand more that they're going to chip away because it's a feel good thing to keep the deal moving. Everybody wants to feel good, feels feel like they won or whatever. So just know we we got three seventy eight, but really we're at three seventy here. And if I can get right. you three seventy two, three seventy five, it, it's a cherry on top. Yep, a hundred percent. And it's that's I think where we're going to start to see. My gut says we're going to start to see. We're going to do a great job. A great job a great job training our agents, right? Our yeah. agents are going to go into those things, into those transactions, knowing what they need to do. But what we, you and I can't control is the skill and the training of the agents on the other side of these yeah. transactions. And so I suspect we're going to start to see our fallout stats go up a little bit just by virtue of the things that we can't control. Yeah. And yeah, I agree with you for sure. You know, deals falling out of contract it will pop up a little bit, but this is this is the market that I enjoy. I mean, that's, this is the kind of market, not this kind of market we're in right now. I was in a really high inventory market in 2012, and, and when, when I started selling in Connecticut, it was like, man, you couldn't even find buyers and all that kind of stuff. But I like a harder market, a more challenging market than extreme demand. Nick Bailey, the CEO of Remax, he said it on the podcast. I don't know, a month or two ago, whenever that one was, he said the last couple of years, some agents have become order takers and they don't realize it. We're going to have to go into a really sk highly skill-based market yep. where these agents understand their value and can deliver the education the consumers need. Yep, without a doubt. I, to your point, this is I, I, I don't know if I said this to you or Tom or somebody else, I felt like for the past two years, we've been on a hamster wheel. Mm -hmm. Generate leads, put them under contract, close them. Generate leads, put them under contract, close them, right? This is the stuff that fires me up. This is a lot more fun. Yep. Yeah, to the navigate this kind of market. And so if you're if you're like, oh, I'm, I'm you know, dreading the market shift, get excited about it, right? That's the mindset I think every agent should have right now. Get excited about this because I believe this is when you can build the biggest brand in your community too. 
and not just the biggest brand, but I think the longest lasting brand. Yeah. It, if you can build it in this market, consumers are going to remember it forever. Because it's hard to break through on a brand when there's savage demand for two years and buyers are just in a rush to the house. I need the house. I don't even care. Like, you're an agent. Great. Come along with me. Jump up. Like, just come along for the ride. Let's go lock it in. I need the house. I need the house. I need to beat everybody else there. When things slow down, normalize, and we're we're in a steadier market, it's okay. I've got time to sit. That person's really interesting. She knows her stuff. She's a true expert. What a brand! Like what a presence! What an educator! I got to get close to that person and get that information. I got. I was fortunate to start my career in 2012 because there was a lot of quiet little corners of the market. And I could create my noise while everybody was just like on autopilot in the New London Day, the one of the oldest papers, by the way, in America. I think it might even be like the oldest like local newspaper. They were all advertising in there and I was making noise on Facebook and it was getting loud because nobody else was doing it at the time. Right. Yep. Those opportunities are still going to pop up in different ways. Yeah. And that's where it's going to be oh, 100%. fun. 100%. Yeah, uh, it's TikTok right now. It's the stuff that you're going to do, like having people into the office and doing wild events and getting the community jazzed up about it. Those are big opportunities. Back to the basics. Yeah. Back to the basics. Back to the basics, but might look a little bit on a different platform, right? Like the basics are educating. Yep. TikTok, right? The basics are educating, having people in the office. And, and maybe there's a different flair. Maybe there's a... You know, maybe there's the Chinati VIP club that comes along with that or something. You, you never, never know. know. You know? You never know. Airline miles. Just don't give them anybody crypto, right? No, no crypto. No, that, that would be bad. All right. Uh, let's wrap this thing up, Lisa, because we've got a big day ahead of us. We've got a lot of content to create today. We do. We've got our mastermind call in a little bit. What's your one, you know, one big thing you want to leave everybody with? At If they're at any level, they could be, you know... A Gino Blafari, something a Gino Blafari to a brand new agent could learn, like your big takeaway, whether that's a personal hack or, you know, something to think about over the next 12 months. It doesn't even have to do with, you know, something tactical in real estate. Just what's your one big thing right now that everybody should know? Uh, I think the one big thing is to to think about all of the plan A's, plan B's, and plan C's. And I think that that's something that and being super strategic is a miss if you don't have, yeah. right? It's great to go all in on plan A, but know kind of like the question that you asked me, where are we going to mess up? Assume that you're going to make a mistake and have plan B ready to go so that it's a seamless transition from plan A to plan B. And know that plan B might need to have a backup too and have it ready to go so that you're not missing and getting in a panic. You know, it's incredible. If you listen to last week's podcast... With Greg Schwartz, former Zillow exec, obviously CEO, founder of Tomo, who's been around the block. He's worked at CNN, he's IMT, he's you know, really smart guy. If you haven't listened to that pod, go back and listen to it. It was just last week. He said the same exact thing in a different way. No way. Absolutely. Ah. The same exact thing. Okay. Right? Being very strategic and incredibly prepared. Yep. Going very deep on your preparation. I'm paraphrasing the way he's, he's got big words and you know, he's a smart guy. So he said it a little bit differently than that, but that's the basics right there being so ultra prepared for anything. And you said plan A, now here's plan B and see if this happens. Yep. Right? Yep. You're probably working on D. Potentially. All right. All right, Lisa, this is gonna be a fun day. I really appreciate you coming on the pod. And uh, if you haven't, Subscribe to the channel yet. If you haven't subscribed, have you subscribed to BAM YouTube, Lisa? Yes. I was probably one of your first subscribers. All right. Do you follow us on Instagram? Yes, I do. All right, good. <laughs> if, you, if you guys haven't done that already, would really appreciate you consider doing that. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you. That's it.